Hi everyone, Dr. Hall here. We're going to get started on the reproductive system. Today's lecture, lecture 36, is Anatomy and Physiology of Male and Female Reproductive Systems. So part 1A or 36A is going to be the male system. Before we get started, a few course announcements. One is that we need to start planning uh, and looking ahead. So this week you'll have the reproductive system and all the typical assignments that you have. Next week we're going to do some cases that will help us to review things we've learned all semester long. There won't be a lot of additional assignments. There probably will be a weekly lecture quiz, but I am anticipating that you should be spending your time studying and preparing for exams, which are the following week. So you have your lab final practicum, which is cumulative, so contains uh, content from the entire semester, as well as the lecture final, which is also cumulative. So also thinking about the end of the semester, when it comes to grades, so it's a numbers thing. So wherever your numbers fall out for the course, that is the grade that you earned, right? I don't give grades. It's just what your numbers turn out to be. That is the grade that you get. I also don't round up past the tenths place or that first decimal. So, um, so just know in advance, even if you're in 89.9, Right, I know it sucks to be you, but I'm not gonna round you up to an A minus. I have to draw the line somewhere, so I'm just telling you in advance, I don't round up. Um, if you need a C or better for your program and you don't think you can get there, or if your grade is gonna be low such that it will pull down your GPA, I want you to strongly consider taking this class for credit, no credit, instead of for a grade. Programs will accept a class with just credit for this semester, so you will be fine that way. Um, and just know that the benchmark in order to get a grade of credit instead of a grade of no credit is 60%. So you wanna make sure that you're gonna at least be there. If you are not gonna able to be able to earn 60% in this course, you can drop the course, and I highly recommend you do that. That's better than getting a no credit or an F. So let's move into male anatomy and physiology. So the basics, right? So this is Michelangelo's The David, famous sculpture, and it works pretty well for our purposes. So of course we have the penis and the scrotum pictured here, as well as some highly stylized pubic hair. All right, so the penis is of course going to be the organ that uh, allows for urination and sexual intercourse and ejaculation of semen, which is necessary to reproduce. And then we have the scrotum here. So this is a skin covered pouch that hangs outside of the body and holds the two testicles. And the reason for the scrotum is because sperm production needs to occur at around 93 to 94 degrees Fahrenheit. That's optimal temperature for sperm production, which is cooler than body temperature. So the scrotum is in some ways a summer porch or a sleeping porch. It allows you to be a little bit outside the main house and a little bit cooler, uh, catch a few breezes, right? So that's the reason why this really important organ is, la uh, is located in a relatively vulnerable place. Okay. So the shaft is the main cylindrical part of the penis and it contains erectile tissue. Three columns of erectile tissue, which we'll talk about more in detail in the lab video in terms of the anatomy, but three columns of erectile tissue, which is this, it really, it looks like a sponge when you cut it open. And what happens is in order to cause an erection, the arteries into the penis dilate and open up. So more blood flow goes into the penis. The veins constrict and close down. So less of that blood can get back out. Therefore, it kind of floods those spongy erectile tissues and causes the penis to elongate, widen, and become firmer. It often will also point upwards or sort of upwards, but it varies from person to person. The gland, and I want to point out here there is no D in this word. Uh, it is not a gland. It does not produce a substance. This is the gland. I don't know why they named it that. It was very unfortunate. And that's the tip of the penis, which you might call the head of the penis. This contains the urethral meatus or external urethral orifice, the opening of the urethra and is normally covered by foreskin, which you can see here when flaccid or not erect. 
Many people in the Midwest, interestingly, have had a circumcision, which is a surgical procedure usually performed on infants, where the foreskin is removed. Um, so the glands is always exposed, but in many parts of this country and the world, uh, people don't routinely circumcise, and so the foreskin, uh, or sometimes it's also called the prepus, is still there. During an erection, the foreskin or prepus kind of retracts and exposes the glands. So I just want to point out a few normal anatomic variations because in my work in student health services, it's not uncommon that people come in with these because they're worried about them. And so I just want to show you a couple of normal anatomic variations of penile anatomy that are not infections. These are not warts. Uh, these are not anything to worry about. So the first has the, one of the best names ever, pearly penile papules. Say that 10 times fast. And they're little tiny bumps um, where the, the glands has that kind of ridge around the outside. And there can be, which is often called the corona, there can be just a few of them or a lot. And so what we can see here are these little tiny bumps. They almost look like little skin tags. These little tiny projections right along. This is the glands out here. This is the shaft of the penis here. So those are pearly penile papules. They're entirely normal. They are not warts. The other thing that I want to point out to you is four dice spots. And what these are are enlarged sebaceous glands. Remember when we learned about skin we learned about sebaceous glands and they can, are just visible under the surface of the skin so you can see kind of these kind of yellow to whitish looking little dots or bumps they can sometimes kind of protrude a little bit and make um, and be a little bit raised there those are four dice spots they're also entirely normal and nothing to worry about and you don't need to do anything about either of these Oh, there's another picture of four dice spots. So this one was on the scrotum, and this one here, you can see them on the penis. Those are just normal sebaceous glands. All right, so let's take a look now at the internal anatomy. So this is a diagram that you can use to help study, and we're going to go through each of these features in turn. So let's start with the testes or the testicles. Those two words are absolutely interchangeable. So these are the male gonads. Gonad is a nonspecific term, and they're paired. You have one on each side sitting in the scrotum. So the gonads have two functions. You're going to produce sex cells, which are also called gametes, and you're going to produce hormones. So in the case of the male gonad or the testicles, you're going to make sperm, and you're going to make testosterone, which is the male sex hormone. So gonads always have two jobs, to make hormones and to make sex cells. In the case of the testicles, you're going to be making testosterone and the sperm. So the sperm are created in these little tiny tubules that are coiled up inside the testicle. You can see here's the testicle. And you see these little coiled tubes. They look like mini ramen noodles. And so if I take one of those out and I do a cross section of it, and I look inside the tubule, this is what you're going to see. Around the outside of the tubule, are the cells that will eventually become sperm. And as they go through that process, they move closer and closer to the lumen of the tubule, and there's where we'll find our finished sperm. So in the lab, we can look at these under the microscope. And so at low power, when you look at a testicle, this is what you see. And so what we're seeing is all those cut ends of those seminiferous tubules, right? So here's one, here's one, here's one we got a little bit diagonally, so it looks oblong, same here, right? So all of these little tiny tubules just packed and coiled into those testicles. Higher power, we can see the nuclei here it looks very grainy. That means it's very active, right? So the, the chromatin is um, unwound and it's replicating. We're going through that process of spermatogenesis or creating sperm. And so your originator cells called your spermatogonium start out here on the periphery of the tubule and then migrate centrally toward the lumen of the tubule as you, they begin to mature into actual sperm, which in this image, I apologize, we can't see very well. 
Once the sperm are produced in these seminiferous tubules, they are then going to move out into this structure, which is a larger coiled tube called the epididymis. Oh, no, he didn't. Oh, epididymis. That doesn't really work, but anything that helps you remember. So the epididymis is this coiled tube that sits kind of on the top and back side of the testicle. And it's where the sperm go for further maturation, learning how to swim and do all the things sperm need to know how to do, as well as storage, right? So this is where they're going to go to await the next ejaculation. If no ejaculation occurs during the lifespan of that particular sperm, sperm live for about five to seven days in general, then the sperm will just die and be reabsorbed, okay? So it doesn't like build up and then explode your epididymis or your testicle. Uh, they'll just die and be reabsorbed. So from the epididymis then, so here's the epididymis over here on our diagram. When the big event comes, right, or while we're waiting for it, sometimes some of the sperm will move into this tube, which travels up out of the scrotum here. So this is the vas deferens, sometimes also called the ductus deferens, and it's gonna come up out of the scrotum into the pelvis, back around behind the bladder, and then we're gonna meet our first gland. So we have several glands in the male reproductive system that are going to contribute to the semen. So semen is the solution that consists of sperm and fluids. So we have several glands that are gonna make fluid containing various substances to help support the sperm. So the first glands that we're going to run into are the seminal vesicles. There's one on each side. We can only see one in this diagram because it's a sagittal view. And as the vas deferens comes along, right, the seminal vesicle here is going to squirt fluid into that tube. And when it does, then the tube continues. This part is called the ejaculatory duct, right? And then that is going to travel through this other gland here, which is the prostate. And there's only one prostate, and it circles around the urethra, right? So here's our urinary bladder. Here's the urethra, right, coming out. So the prostate, there's just one. It kind of sits like a donut around the urethra. That ejaculatory duct travels through it. And the prostate also secretes fluid into then the prostatic urethra, that part of the urethra traveling through the prostate. Now the seminal vesicles and the prostate gland are only going to secrete these fluids when there is an ejaculation. So this is part of the ejaculation process, is the sperm being moved up through the vas deferens as a result of muscular contractions in the vas deferens, and the seminal vesicles and the prostate glands secreting fluid in here as well, and then everything will get pushed out through muscular contractions in the penis out through the urethra. Now, in order to facilitate that process and the squirting of the semen out through the penis, we have a pair of glands called the bulbourethral glands. And so they're these little tiny bulb-like glands located just next to the urethra. So that's how you remember the name. They're sometimes called Cowper's glands, so if you see them called that in some places, that is also a correct name. And what they do, it's really interesting. So they secrete a mucus-rich fluid right before ejaculation. So this is pre-ejaculate. You might know it as pre-cum, for example. This is a tiny amount of mucusy fluid that kind of gets squirted out through the urethra and it clears out any old little bits of urine or things that might have been in the urethra. And it also makes it like a nice, smooth, slippery tube, right? So it's almost like squirting water on your slip and slide or the Zamboni machine at the ice rink, right? Making it nice and smooth and easy then for the semen to be um, ejaculated. So then of course we have the urethra and the urethra is a double duty tube, which is different from the female reproductive system. So the urethra in the male transports urine, but it also transports semen, right? So it depends on what's happening at the moment. So semen, I mentioned it before. So this is sperm 
from the vas deferens, right, that were brought up from the epididymis after they were made in the seminiferous tubules of the testicles, and then secretions from the seminal vesicles in the prostate glands, and there's a little bit of residual mucus from the bulbal urethral glands, right, but the secretion of the bulbal urethral glands isn't really technically part of um, uh, the ejaculate because that's excreted before, that's pre-ejaculate, but anyway. There are some really important things in semen. So there's fructose, which is a sugar. That's the same sugar that's found in fruit, hence the name. And that serves as an energy source for the sperm. So sperm have a lot of mitochondria because they need to power their tails and swim. So the fructose is the sugar that they are going to break down to convert into ATP. There are also some prostaglandins. Prostaglandins are these interesting chemical compounds that encourage uterine contraction in the female. And so it's felt that that kind of helps create uh, almost like a wave leg or a suction kind of action that helps get the sperm up into the uterus. Some people tell me it's important for pigs. I don't know. And then the other thing about semen is that it has an alkaline or a basic pH of so somewhere between 7.4 and 8. And that's really important because the vagina is actually quite acidic. And so you need that buffering capacity of this slightly alkaline fluid to help protect the sperm against the acidity of the vagina. Without that, they would be lost, right? So... The male reproductive system is regulated in a nice kind of straightforward way, relatively speaking. Females is a little bit different, so we're, that's why we're doing male first. All right, so first of all, our friend the hypothalamus in the brain. So we know, right, the hypothalamus is important for thirst, and it's important for body temperature regulation and all kinds of things, right? It can help activate the parasympathetic or sympathetic nervous systems, right? Those two branches of the autonomic nervous system, depending on what's going on. It can uh, cause, uh, you know, vasodilation in the skin to help get rid of excess body heat, right? So the hypothalamus is this interesting part of the brain because it's part of the nervous system and part of the endocrine system. So when it comes to the reproductive system, a lot of the functions of the hypothalamus have to do with hormone production and regulation. So it's endocrine function. And so what the hypothalamus does for the male reproductive system is secretes a hormone called GNRH, which stands for gonadotropin releasing hormone. And if the hypothalamus secretes GNRH, GNRH excuse me, that's going to tell the pituitary gland to make its two hormones, LH and FSH. LH and FSH then go down to the gonads. And so I just want to take a moment to say all of this is going to be basically the same in male or female. So LH and FSH are going to go to the gonads and tell them to do their thing. So um, it's going to tell them to make hormones and to make sex cells. This diagram doesn't have the gamete production part, the sperm or egg production part listed on it, um, but that will happen as well. So hypothalamus makes GnRH, which tells the pituitary to make LH and FSH, which tells the gonads to get to work to produce gametes, sperm, and hormones, testosterone for the testes. So how is this regulated? And you can see there are these arrows here kind of giving you a clue. So what's interesting is that the hypothalamus and also the pituitary to a lesser extent is also constantly surveying and seeing what levels of testosterone or estrogen and progesterone are present in the bloodstream. And so if testosterone levels get relatively high, the hypothalamus is going to say, oh, I guess we can all take a break for a little while. The hypothalamus will stop making GnRH. So then the pituitary will stop making LH and FSH. And then the testes will take a little bit of a break. So I think you know what type of a feedback system this is. Right? Of course, it is a negative feedback system. Right? So negative feedback system. If testosterone levels get high, the hypothalamus is going to shut off the system. So then testosterone production shuts off. 
then testosterone levels will gradually get low again. So the hypothalamus will turn everything back on. It'll make GnRH, which tells the pituitary to make LH and FSH, which tells the testicles to get back to work. Right? So uh, this is a nice example of a negative feedback system, like many others that we've already seen in the human body. So that's it for the male reproductive system. Part B, we will talk about the female reproductive system.